Good afternoon. afternoon. We're ready to start. Are you guys ready? Great. I'm back. I'm Caitlin. You know me. Um, Chair of the board. I am introducing our moderator, Gail Martin. Gail Martin's third collection, Disappearing Queen, won the Two Sylvia's Press Wilder Prize in 2021. Begin Empty Handed won the Perugia Press Poetry Prize in 2013, and the following year was winner of the Housatonic Book Award for Poetry. The Hourglass Heart, out by New Issues Prose and Poetry, was published in 2003. Recently, her work has been featured in both Poetry Daily and Verse Daily. She works as a psychotherapist in private practice here in Kalamazoo. She also happens to be my mother and one of my favorite poets. Yay! That's adorable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for keeping it professional, Katie. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who contributed to this event. There was a lot of seed planting and a lot of uh, cultivating and watering and weeding and all of those things. I don't want to overwork the metaphor, mm -hmm. but anytime you're dealing with people and details, it's an enormous task, and we are the beneficiaries of a lot of hard work. And I'm feeling really lucky that I get to have this conversation with um, three poets that I esteem highly. Mm -hmm. um, I am just going to ask that if I do anything with the mic, that is giving feedback? Will someone do something dramatic that I noticed? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Are you doing that because I... <laughs> no. <laughs> it was a dress It was another dress one of my okay. offspring. <clears throat> of... <laughs> I know. <clears throat> I'm going to read the list of achievements of our guest poets. I know it's really easy to tune out when the list is substantial, but I'm going to urge you to tune in. Um, the complexities and awfulness of the world's present moment sometimes overshadows everything. I want you to look at what these three human beings have already brought into the world. What a flowering. And if you add up their ages, they're probably not even 100. So we have a lot to look <laughs> forward to. It is with great admiration that I introduce you to Hala Alian, Kaveh Akbar, and Tracy Brimhall. <clears throat> if these bios need updating, it's not my fault. Uh -huh. So, well, and I think fine. there have been a couple <laughs> of changes. Hala Alian is the author of the novel Salt Houses, winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Arab American Book Award and a finalist for the Chautauqua Prize as well as the novel, The Arsonist City, released in 2020, and four award-winning collections of poetry. Most recently, You're Not a Girl in the Movie, in a Movie, 2021, and the 29th year, 2019. Her work has been published by The New Yorker, The Academy of American Poets, Lit Hub, The New York Times Book Review, and Garnica. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, and I think a bambino. And a daughter. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and That's a daughter. Right. That's right. Um, and she works as a clinical psychologist. Kave Akbar is the author of Pilgrim Bell, Grey Wolf 2021, and Calling a Wolf a Wolf, Alice James Books 2017. He is the author of a chat book, Portrait of the Alcoholic, Sibling, Ri Sibling Rivalry Press, 2017. He's the editor of the Penguin Book of Spiritual Verse, 110 Poets on the Divine. Mm. Cave is the recipient of the Levis Reading Prize, multiple Pushcart Prizes, Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship, and Civitella Ranieri Fellowship. Cave is the founding editor of Dive Dapper, a home for interviews with major voices in contemporary poetry. Born in Tehran, he teaches at, not Purdue now? Iowa, sorry. 
he teaches at Nat Purdue, but Iowa, <laughs> um, and in the low residency MFA programs at Randolph College and Warren Wilson. His poems appear in The New Yorker, Poetry, PBS NewsHour, Paris Review, Best American Poetry, The New York Times, and elsewhere. Cave currently serves as poetry editor for The Nation. That's the publication, not the country. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy Brimall is the author of four poetry collections, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod, Copper Canyon, Sodaje, Copper Canyon, Our Lady of the Ruins, W.W. Norton, winner of the Bernard Women Poets Prize, and Rookery, Southern Illinois University Press winner of the Crab Orchard series in Poetry First Book Award. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry, The Believer, The New Republic, Orion, New York Times Magazine, and Best American Poetry. She has received fellowships from the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing and the National Endowment for the Arts, and she is Poet Laureate of Kansas. Ooh. So yay, help me welcome these three. <laughs> Beginnings are a little hard, I've been telling people. I'm looking for that sweet spot between the diaspora and what's your favorite musical, and I'm not sure that I've really identified it. But I thought we would um, start with a process question about um, what gets us started on poems. Um, Bronwyn Tate talks about a shifting approach in her writing where she moved from being very explicit in her intentions, like every day I will write for 30 minutes on mm. sandpipers and family secrets, or 500 words on baseball and climate change, to engaging with some activity that supports writing or is a corollary to writing without actually being writing. Mm. And I'm curious to know what you think about that strategy and what your corollary would be. Hmm. I, I just want to, I think my life changes so the way I relate to writing has to change. Um, I brought up in the class this morning on the Body Electric that when I was living and writing in New York City, I had a process, and then I moved to Wisconsin, and I was like, Wisconsin just doesn't have the magic. Um, and then one day I was on the, the floor, and I bent over, and then all of a sudden I started to be able to write, because in New York City I just wrote, sitting on my bed, crisscross applesauce, and bent over. It was stressing yeah. me out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Just I was got in your hair and I was like, I just, I need to, it, it, was, was, it was a wasp or something. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, I was watching you very afraid, not because I was worried about the question, but I was watching the wasp behind you vigilantly. Thank you. Um, but, but then I realized that my body had learned that in that bent over position, crisscross applesauce and bent over my legs, that's when the writing happened. And I was like, oh no, that's not sustainable. I can't write like that forever. Mm. Um, and then I invented a new... I always call it building the spell of like, what are the things I need to do with, with language or with my body that helps me start writing? Um, and I also knew that I wanted to become a parent um, and that my time would go away and my, the way I'd be able to work would have to change. Um, and so I, I went ahead and I changed writing before I had a kid, but then of course I didn't predict mm. <laughs> what being a parent was like, and then I had to change again. Um, but just realizing that the circumstances of my life change, which creates a change in the voice of writing and what I'm able to do. Um, but I think the biggest favor I try and do myself is I call them, sometimes I just say I'm writing a blob today, or mm. I try and find ways mm. to make it not, um, heavy or like full of like I must draft a I must write a poem today mm. of just like I I scrap write or I say I'm going to record my five senses of the day or I find ways in which to engage in writing that doesn't make me uh, start judging myself yeah. um, mm. but ways in which writing is still play ways in which writing is still pleasure um, things like that, not th things that try and get the, the word poem away from me so that I don't, <laughs> you know, carry too much expectation into the writing process itself. Hmm. I was going to say that I think I had a s similar 
I started off very rigid, and so if you look at interviews after the first novel, the way that I wrote my two novels was that I wrote for 30 minutes a day, and that was my practice for like a decade. Every day, doesn't matter when, doesn't matter where, I would do 30 minutes, and I would try to leave the scene on a cliffhanger. So I feel like a lot of writing is trying to trick yourself into writing. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to like have something to look forward to to come back to the next day. And then the year of COVID happened, and with that came, for me, like a two-year stretch of infertility and a bunch of miscarriages mm -hmm. and a time when the body was really... Like, I couldn't bear to be in the body in any way. And that included sitting, like being sedentary or like trying to mine the self for anything. I just felt like I just couldn't do it. And so I, when I talk about writing practice with students, I talk about grace a lot and like giving yourself grace and like thinking about your life circumstances and whatever. And actually having a kid, shockingly, has been like I thought my time was gonna get really warped and there was gonna be no time, but it turned out for me the block was the sort of like striving and the infertility and the COVID blech and all of that, mm. that actually having a kid has been extremely inspiring. And I will say too, I, I have childcare part-time and so 30 minutes means like something different than what 30 minutes used to mean. It means that I have 30 minutes to myself. Like those 10 minutes that I just was upstairs shoving food in my mouth, I was like, oh. Like, so there's something about like now when I know that I am choosing to be sitting at this desk and reading or writing or whatever instead of being with my daughter and that there's someone watching her, it's not even financial, it's like emotional, where I'm like, I'm choosing to do this thing. You can't do 10 things at the same time. I am choosing to be attentive and to do this thing. Therefore, I can fully pour myself into it. And I find that my relationship to time and like presence has changed a lot. Um, and I'll say in terms of like the corollaries, I, I really like, I find doing something that is incompatible with writing to help get the juices flowing. So showering, I do sculpting sometimes, so if my hands are in wet clay, I'll think of things, but I can't like write it down. Like I actually find it really useful to be doing things, particularly hand-based things like weaving or whatnot, um, because there's something about that that gets me. Again, maybe it's just I just want to do the things. I, I may be just a contrarian. I don't know, but there's something about doing something, well, and I'm like, works. now I can't be writing, and now suddenly all I want to do is like write these ideas yeah. down. No. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything particularly interesting to <laughs> add. Uh, I think that what's been said is pretty good. I'll say that um, it is often the case that a poet's form follows their living, right? Which mm -hmm. is to say, I think that both Tracy and Hala have spoken beautifully to that. But, um, you know, when asked why she wrote such short poems, Lucille Clifton, who was a mother of four, said, that's how long yep. I have, you know, like I have to, you know, that's how long it takes my kids to nap. Um, and, you know, the great Kalamazoo poet, uh, Oliver Bendorf, um, or great poet of Kalamazoo, um, his first book, The Lines, were very, very short. And he, he's spoken about this publicly. I'm not betraying any confidences. I've, I've seen him speak about this in interviews, but his lines were very short. And then in his second book, The Lines got quite longer and when asked about that he spoke about having top surgery in the way that he no longer had to bind his chest and so he could inhale more deeply right and so he mm. got more breath so the mm. lines could get longer right and mm. there are so many ways in which the strictures of our living shape the way that we sound on the page and you know we're all coming from an unprecedented experience you know no one in this room I would Wager was born in Tehran, Iran, and then, you know, moved to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania when they were a child, and then moved to Trenton, New Jersey, and then, you know, and then moved to Milwaukee, and, you know, like, no one has, like, followed the exact trajectory of my life, nor have you read the books that I've read in the order that I've read them with, like, watch, having the conversations in the order that I had them, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I have an unprecedented idiom, and so allowing the shape of my writing to reflect that, I think, illuminates both, right? It illuminates the living and it illuminates the writing. Um, I got a great piece of advice years ago from Dai Seuss who said, keep your relationship to writing casual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it That's can just great. be anywhere, anytime, on yeah. your phone, on your mm -hmm. arm. And um, Beth Ann Finley said after she completed writing a novel, um, about deliberately lowering the stakes, which was what moved her to 
her micro memoir pieces because if it totally sucks, at least I haven't spent two years writing it. So <laughs> I liked that. Maybe this is a good place to talk a little bit about hybrid forms. Um, and and if, if that fits in with the generative piece and how you keep those fires going, great. Tracy, I know, push back if I get this wrong, but I remember you saying that you have a, you, I think you just said it, that you have a practice of writing bad poems. Yeah. And in your most recent book, you intersperse um, essays in with the poems. And I, Hala, I came to your writing first through the novels. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you wrote poetry. Um, and Kave, it seems to me that the tone and certainly the form of your work in Pilgrim Bell is super different from um, the first book that, that I read, Calling a Woof a Woof, among other things by using some pretty innovative punctuation. Um, how do each of you being, having so many tricks up your sleeve, decide which form best serves that which you're trying to express. I don't want this conversation to make it feel like you have to start every time. I was going to say, what about I was just going to say, you guys, you can just And so I will leap into the, I will leap into the frame manfully. Uh, and, <laughs> and, um, and say, yeah, that's a generous question. I also feel like I should defer because I think that you two work with hybridity more interestingly than I do. I, I just tend to write poems and then when I'm writing prose, I just tend to be writing prose. Mm -hmm. But um, you spoke to the punctuation in Pilgrim Bell, which I suppose is a thing I can speak to. The first book that I wrote, Calling a Wolf a Wolf, was very... It was written at a time in my life when I was getting sober, when I was like just at the beginning stages of um, very early sobriety. And the poems were very much a sort of place to put myself, you know, where I could just be writing a poem for three or five hours and I wouldn't have to worry about accidentally killing myself. You know, I mean, it really was that They simple. felt like little life rafts to Yeah, me. yeah, and that's what they were. You know, they, yeah. you know, they, were, they were sort of... Um, sort of in every context of the word life rap, you know, they were sort of like just slap shod put together and they were, and I think that that slap shodness is like, I, I'm not saying that in a pejorative way, um, but I, they were very much sort of uneven and wobbly and they were also like um, super saturated, you know, mm -hmm. um, they, were, they were big and loud. Um, and then once the membrane between me and an early preventable death had thickened a little bit, just marginally, you know, just like an infinitesimal <laughs> fraction of a millimeter, um, I think that I began to look outwards a little bit more, like beyond, you know, the back of my own eyelids. And, um, and in that looking... I became very skeptical of, sorry, I'm thinking slowly. Um, I became very skeptical of the language of certainty, just broadly speaking. I became very skeptical of certainty and I realized that I was sort of suffused in the language of certainty on social media, you know, like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but blah, 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 you know, like, or like, you know, if you're not doing da, 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 you should feel bad about yourself. You know, like, just like the language of certainty became, I, I found myself becoming very allergic to that um, because it's also the language of empire, right? Like, immigrants are evil and, you know, climate change is a hoax and this new Rolex will make you sexually irresistible. You know, like, like these... I'm serious, like this is, this is the language of empire and it was also the language being used to induce shame among people that I felt were my comrades, right? Um, and, uh, and so I, be, I realized that in my increasing intolerance for that language, I realized that the English language, you know, the medium of my art, um, you know, there are four kinds of sentences. It's interrogative, imperative, declarative, and exclamatory. Well, 
Exclamatory, interrogative, declarative. And imperative. And imperative. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what I said. I right? didn't know any of those. Yeah. So. <laughs> Good job. I said that, right? Good right? job. I think I said that. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Like I'm sorry. Four kinds of stuff. I'm like, what do yeah, you mean? Yeah, but I mean, like, uh, uh, to, uh, the most common kinds are declarative and imperative, the, mo mm. the kinds that we use most often in colloquial speech. And both of those are like you're declaring something to be the case or you're telling someone to do something, mm. right? Both of those are very certain of themselves, right? Mm. Um, they're both, you know, it's a language built around um, these two different articulations of certainty. Both take the period. And, um, and so I became obsessed with the period in a way, and I mm. became obsessed with ways to play from the period, its certainty. And so in Pilgrim Bell, there are many poems that are like hyper punctuated, like, like the ways that like Merwin and Clifton and um, Ellen Bryan Voigt sort of like sucked up all the periods and commas in their poems. Um, there are poems in Pilgrim Bell that sort of do the opposite of that, right? Which is to just sort of like, you know, blow dandelion seeds of peri periods all over the, mm. you know, all over the stanzas. And, um, and that was a way of training myself to look past certainty, you know, or just like, just like, it was like a practice in my living, you know, it was also just like a corrosive thing that I was doing in my mm. own living, you know, within my marriage, within my teaching, within my relationship to the world was like thinking in certainties and rushing to in hasty, rushing to hasty inorganic conclusions in order to resolve uncertainty. Um, and so it was a way of training myself as well. Mm. I don't know if that answered your question That's at beautiful. all. That's beautifully said. I, you know, I was just saying this to someone that I always feel, I don't know if it's because I have not been formally trained in writing or didn't know that there were four kinds of sentences or didn't know, like, <laughs> like there's, there is a certain kind of imposter syndrome that I have, I think, when it comes to writing about craft or, or, yeah, working with craft and how my craft comes about in that the truthful, honest answer is just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just kind of want to do mm -hmm. something and I'm curious about it mm -hmm. and something snags me the way that like clothes get snagged on a nail and I keep mm -hmm. looping back around and around to something and I just, I dream something, I perseverate on something I overhear in a subway and that, that those are really my beginning points. And I will say like, I think like anything in life, you kind of learn if you're stubborn, you learn the hard way. I think in the beginning of my writing, I really wanted to make, if I was like, this is gonna be a novel, and I'd be like this, and I'd like be really dogged about it and keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And like some things just don't wanna be novels. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like some things are like, you're done saying everything you have to say about it in a page and a half, mm -hmm. and it is what it is. And some, and my first novel started as a short story. So I think what I have come to, so I think it's sort of similar actually to this idea of certainty and kind of like, um, rigidity and black and white thinking. Like I think what I've come to learn, and this may be, it may be that there's no shortcuts to this, it may be that this is just like any muscle one of practice, but like something that's come to me with time is like trusting that the thing is gonna tell you what it wants to be. And that might be through time, it might be through error, it might be through telling you what it doesn't wanna be, but like I will start to work on something now and I'm less attached to genre. I'm less attached mm -hmm. to the idea of former genre. It kind of doesn't matter, you know? Like it matters for marketing-ish and like how you're gonna sell something, whatever, but like in terms of the, the core and the process, it kind of is very similar for me. And so what I've come to realize is I'm just gonna start writing and I'm gonna follow the thread in the ways that I wanna follow it and it'll tell me pretty soon what it wants to be. Mm -hmm. You know, and like that's it. And I don't, I know it's really hard to teach that though or to talk about it in any way that's useful mm -hmm. actually. But it is. It's only unuseful because we want certainty. <laughs> I think maybe that's what it is. Exactly. 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 I'm so, I'm we so want grappling clarity. with that thing, exactly. yeah. yeah. Um, I think, I, I mean, I was, a poet because I had a really good poetry teacher. I thought I was going to be a novelist. Mm. Um, but I think also what I love about poems is it's like always going on really hot dates of like, it's really fun. You have a great time and then it's over and you don't have to work on anything. You still have a <laughs> you, you can yes. revise. But 
but also in the new book, I, there's a series of poems, the Dear Thanatos poems. I always called them my one night stands because mm -hmm. I, I've, I'm very book projecty. I sort of do have the relationships that also have the hot dates. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm in a relationship with the book and I'm doing all of these things, but the Dear Thanatos poems for years and years and years, mm -hmm. those were just one night stands. I would just, when I just wanted to write a poem mm -hmm. and like I just was ex worn out by my relationship. So on the side, I'd have a little adventure with darkness <laughs> And I just write. I just write to my darkness, and my darkness would always talk back to me. Hmm. And then I caught feelings for my one night stands, and they ended up in that last <laughs> book. Um, but those poems weren't meant to be like part of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess my thought about genre too is like you should always have something. You're, whether you're calling it blobs, whether you're saying like I'm just going to write a bad poem today. I love telling myself I'm going to write a bad poem, and then if it turns out good, I'm like yay. Mm -hmm. But if it turns out bad, I'm like I did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you get to celebrate either way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people should have non-productive creative practices of like, okay. what's the one night stand for your creative pr yeah. process? Like what's just Say the a plan? lot about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one night stands, everyone. I mean, live your romantic lives the way you want to live those. But like in your creative practice, I think not having every creative piece need to go into the capitalist machine of revision and then it's in a journal and then you got to mm -hmm. get the book out and then you got to like just make shit because it's fun and feels good and yeah. um, that it makes you happy. Um, I think I started going towards essays because one, I was no longer learning new things about the poem at least mm. the poem with mm -hmm. my voice in it. Yeah. And so I liked playing with a different genre. I also think I'm getting older and I get spend more time thinking about something. I think poems were such a great form for my 20s because it's like, this thing, this thing. Or maybe <laughs> my brain is less distracted by squirrels. Um, and so I, I am slowing down just as a person and I'm spending more, more and more and more time thinking, maybe ruminating too much, but mm. spending more time on certain ideas um, I think both of them, you know, still driven by things I lived through mm -hmm. and both still hmm. driven by facts, as in like, I think facts are a way of being intimate with the world. I love learning new things about the world and I love using, you know, trying to get people interested in my love life or my trauma so that I can actually tell them some cool facts about bees. <laughs> um, of like, most of the time I think I'm just like tantalizing so people with my personal life so that I can tell them cool shit I know. <laughs> Um, mostly I think that's the, the treat. It's like putting the peanut butter around the pill for the dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you differently now. Like, <laughs> Here's something about my romantic life, but did you know <laughs> the chameleon's tongue is longer than its body? It's so cool. Is it? It is! Wow. And it just rolls up in there. You learn something. <laughs> that's pretty it's awesome. so cool. That's pretty cool. It's so cool. <laughs> I'm sure everybody approaches this in their own way, but I don't think we really can just pretend that the pandemic is not happening or hasn't happened. And I'm curious how, and maybe it depends where you were living at the beginning, but I'm curious how that has infiltrated your writing, um, maybe existentially, maybe practically. You spoke a little bit yeah. to that, Hala. Have anything to speak to I feel there? like it's my turn to go first, but I also feel like I already talked about it. Nope, I no think it just, <laughs> I think it, it, I mean, it was just a very dry, awful, like my, my grandfather died. I just could not, I, I think of those months as one long walk up first Avenue to the fertility clinic with my like double mask. Like there's a very <laughs> visceral memory. Like it's, I can like feel exactly in my gut what that like those first like few months were. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I think like the legacy of it to me personally is I am so, so grateful to be in community with other bodies again. Mm -hmm. And so grateful because it was a really dark time in, in sort of like, you know, national, internationally, and then also on these like personal levels and you couldn't be with people. Mm -hmm. You couldn't like, my grandfather died in Beirut and like no one was there and there was mm -hmm. nothing we could do about it. Um, and I think there's something about just being able to share physical space with people again that it, it does not, it still feels new enough that it like catches me sometimes by surprise and I'm like, oh, what a delight. And I yeah. also just feel really glad to be making things again to your point. Like I feel glad to have whatever block, dry spot, whatever you want to call it, whatever language you want to call it, to be like curious about the world again. It feels like a real blessing. Both of my parents worked on farms most of my life. My dad worked on duck farms um, uh, until he retired. And, um, and a true thing about 
farming um, is that when you take a cow to the abattoir, um, if you let him see the cow in front of him being, sorry, this is dark, but if you let the cow in front of him see, or, sorry, if you let him see the cow in front of him being slaughtered, it releases a stress hormone in the meat and it like ruins the meat, right? Mm -hmm. Like you guys are not, like you guys know this, but we're in the Midwest, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, a, it's like a thing, right? Like you, you have to design the abattoir so the cows can't see the, the cows in front of them dying or so the goat can't see the goat in front of it dying, right? This is also halal meat is, uh, orbits this principle. But, um, but I've been thinking a lot lately about the meatness of myself, you know, like because mm -hmm. of the corn, you know, like what does having an auto scroll, you know, uh, autoplay snuff film on my phone in between, you know, an ad for toilet paper and an ad for the new Pokemon game, you know, seeing like a snuff film of state murder of an unarmed civilian, what does that do to my meat, right? Like what is that, what is, what is like seeing the COVID numbers and like seeing the people on respirators do to my meat, right? I've had a number of relatives die in Iran because of US sanctions that made it so that we couldn't send ventilators and we couldn't send the vaccines and other countries couldn't send the vaccines to Iran without getting in. So Iran was per capita one of the worst countries in the world for COVID death rates. What does my, like my relatives were living in mortal terror right like mortal terror for themselves and for their family members i am a tenured professor in iowa who was morally outraged you know the delta between my outrage and their mortal terror is profound right mm -hmm. i think this is one of the great lessons that blm taught a lot of people too right is that the delta between your umbrage at injustice happening and someone else's terror that their children are in, are in danger, right? That, that is a wide gulf, right? And so what, what responsibility does that imply sitting on this end of the outrage? You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Um, sitting on this end of the, that spectrum, right? Like I wasn't, you know, I'm a healthy, hearty, you know, I run, I, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm, I have health insurance, right? Um, I'm the 1% globally. And so what does, what does that imply, right? Um, these are questions that I've been thinking a lot about. Even with my students or my nieces, I think about when I talk on the phone, I tend to pace. I tend to, I don't know if you guys are like this, like when you're speaking on the phone, like I can't just like sit in a chair and say like, ah, how are you doing, brother? You know, like, I, like I'm like pacing around, you know what I mean? Like I'm pacing around and I'm, you know, and I, and this is like a universal human behavior. Not everyone exhibits it, but a lot of people do. And people have theorized that the reason is because our lizard brains don't understand the idea of speaking to a voice that we can't see. Right? Um, like there's nowhere in our evolutionary history where we would be speaking at like, a, at like a room volume speaking voice to a person that we couldn't plainly see. And so we're like subconsciously like just pacing around trying to find that, trying to resolve that dissonance, right? And thinking about that is so sort of charming and sweet and sad. But then like thinking about like my younger niece who just thinks that going into the world means putting on a mask. Right, who like, just like straight up like doesn't, doesn't think it's like a COVID thing. Like she has only existed in a world where when you leave the house, you put on a mask, mm. right? Like that's not, that's not in response to any, that's just like when you go into the world, you put on a mask. So she, you know, doesn't see the bottoms of people's faces emoting outside of the mm. house. You know what I mean? And so like there are like developmental, right? And, you know, she had, you know, she attended kindergarten kindergarten? Pre maybe preschool. She, I think she attended her preschool. Like, it was like a Zoom preschool. Like, what does Zoom mean to a preschool? Like, they can't read. You know what I mean? Like, they can't read the, like, mute button. You know what I'm saying? Like, what does Zoom mean to a pre... Right? And then, like, having, like, not just the voices, but the, like, apparitions of your beloved appearing, right, for this period of time. I have a friend who's a cardiologist. I'll stop talking after this. But I have a friend who's a cardiologist in San Francisco, uh, former, another c former student, current friend, who said that so many of his elderly patients, just like their cognitive declines were just accelerated so, so rapidly because they just weren't getting the reps. You know, they just weren't getting the, um, because they were in isolation, they just weren't getting like the people talking to them every day or like going to the store and having the, you know what I mean? And just, I mean, it's gonna take generations to unpack, you know, the sort of like, 
cultural, sociological, psycho, spiritual, emotional effects of this thing, right? It's going to take generations to unpack that. But like the way it can't be inert, you know what I mean? Like it can't, like it can't have done nothing to my meat. You know what I mean? That's what I keep thinking about is like, if that, if that shit makes it so that you can't eat that cow, like I'm not so far evolutionarily removed from that cow that it just does nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I don't know what that is, right? I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a, you know, neurologist or whatever, but, um, you know, all, all inductive reasoning points to the idea that it can't be inert, right? So like mm -hmm. figuring out what has shifted in me, what has changed in me, um, is something I'm really interested in now. Okay, my cool fact, and I don't know how entomologists figured this out, but the butterfly retains the caterpillar's nervous system. Mm -hmm. So even though it is reduced to fucking goo inside chrysalis, right? It, once it's a butterfly, it still has the same nervous system. And so I've been thinking about this because I've been, I've read a cultural history of the phoenix. I've been writing a lot about fire. I've been thinking, I hate the phoenix so much because it is such an easy and bullshit metaphor um, because the butterfly retains the caterpillar's nervous system. You cannot live forever. You cannot constantly resurrect yourself without a cost. I can, I can do it, I'm strong, Ugh. But the cost of being a phoenix is being alone. Um, that bird's always alone. Um, and so it's just, and I'm just like exhausted by how many times I've had to restart my life there's no other choice, um, but that is that is the thing I'm thinking about with the the pandemic is um, just how many times I have to keep starting over mm -hmm. and how exhausting that is and how um, everybody's like language of being strong and keep going and yes it's all worth it and yeah it's all beautiful but there is yeah the meat has changed mm -hmm. um, I still have the same nervous system and in fact things show up in my body that are old memories that just haven't been dealt with yet. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned a little bit in my workshop talking about um, the body as well, that one of the things that I started to do during COVID, um, because I couldn't, my brain was very foggy um, and I felt like I couldn't think right. But I, so I would, my journaling, my writing practice was just one thing from the five senses a day. And so even if I couldn't be in present in a moment when I'm walking the dog in the cold and I'm just annoyed that it's cold and, you know, like exhausted and like I'm in a field and it smells like cow, but like later I'm like, smell of cow shit, right? That's my smell of the day. Um, that my, my feeling was like my skin feeling tight on my cheeks because it was so cold. And as I would do the five senses, it would just like help me be in my day better, mm -hmm. even if it was retroactive. And because of um, needing tape, like I started to pay a lot of attention to cooking. And, you know, these are the same examples as before. I'm sorry, it's not new. But like the papery feel of like the, the garlic clove and then mm -hmm. like getting the paper off and how like slippery. And like, what is that feeling? Or just like mm -hmm. noticing the feels, the smells, you know, like I'm just like excited to put the onions in the pan with the hot pot. And I'm like, there it is. Um, but I did, it didn't take rather than it being a place where I'm like thinking about my to-do list and other things, right? Like I'm just so deeply present when I cook and it's, it's been serving me still, but I've been thinking about how also how many, the decisions we make about the language we use for ourselves and our lives and others. Um, because also I always thank my Alexa and my son makes fun of me. And I was like, when the AI overlords come, you're going to be glad I was nice to them. I do the same uh, thing. <laughs> But I think also how we treat non-human things I do the is same it's really thing. important to be polite. Yeah. Alexa did me a you favor. You don't know what Why the fuck's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to remember. <laughs> <laughs> but like you, you can create these habits just like tiny tweaks at a time. But like I just started to be really relaxed at cooking time and deeply present. And then I was like, oh my God. Like I had like inadvertently trained myself or taught myself how to do this just simply because I was just doing a stupid little five minute exercise, stupid, mm. um, a beautiful five minute beautiful exercise, exercise because the language we use really matters. Mm. Um, that the, the language we use changes mm. how we experience those things. The, the, the treating AI with respect 
using positive metaphors around our relationships and our health and our bodies. Um, I, I do think all of that is fundamental. And I said it in class, but Ursula K. Le Guin said words are events. And I really mm. fundamentally believe there is energy in our language and it shapes the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about others. And we can inadvertently train ourselves um, into having more joy and feeling more present, mm. even as we're goo in the crystal. Yeah. <laughs> I love your language. Um, so, if we imagine some kind of a continuum um, where we place activities that create positive growth and change in the world, where do you put poetry? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess what I'm saying, that, do you feel that artists, all writers, not just poets, have an obligation slash responsibility to tackle issues related to climate, interstate violence, racism. Um, I mean, hmm. we could generate a list with no problem, but, but where do you personally, do you believe what Auden said about poetry making nothing happen? Where? The only thing I know that poetry has ever done to change me is made me feel less alone. And I think it gave me, it's given me a lot of lessons in how to be human. And I'm still trying to figure that I don't know how to solve global warming. I don't even know how to be a person <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, maybe that's enough that we just feel less alone because somebody was honest with us or because somebody said something that kind of shook us awake. I think poetry makes my soul sit up straighter in my body. And for that, I'm really grateful. But I don't, I mean, I, Kava had a really great talk, craft talk today, and there was a lot about goodness, and I, I do think about it all the time, um, and reactive, you know, stuff, outrage stuff. How do you actually affect change? How do you actually change the world? I don't know, I just give my, like, Planned Parenthood donation every month. I just, because I don't know how to change the world. Um, I don't think I have the answers. I think I'm a clueless middle-aged human being um, who's good with words. Mm. Um, and I, want, I, I wish I knew more than that. I wish I could help more than that. But the way I hope, I think I might help, or I hope I help, is just that people get, read a poem sometimes and recognize themselves or see something new. And we're like, wow, I didn't know people lived like that or felt like that. Mm. Um, but that it's, I just want to be, I'm really working on being as human as possible, which means the poems are going to be messed up and angry and a little fucked up sometimes, mm -hmm. that they might not be the best, they might not be moral, um, but if, if maybe they help other people the way they helped me, it might just be with loneliness. Mm. That's beautiful. One of the things I tell, so I'm a, um, I teach grad psych students and I supervise them. I'm, like you were saying, a clinical psychologist and I also have a clinical practice. And one of the things I'll say, be tell beginning clinicians is that you can work with people you don't like effectively. You can treat people you don't like. You can treat people who have done despicable things. It's very hard to treat people you're not curious about. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to do good clinical work if you can't find some kernel of curiosity about them and their context and how they got there and all that. So I, what I want to say is that I think art matters to a point, and I think poetry matters to a point. However, and I think this is, this, you touched on this in your, in your talk of it, I do not think poetry or art is a replacement for actionable change, policy change, um, being of service in different ways in in real time with real people. Um, so I, th I it, it's like necessary sufficient conditions, right? It, I think like it can absolutely be live in tandem with those things, but I do not think it's a replacement for them. And I think one of the things that happens sometimes you, is you might feel like you've written about something or thought about something or lectured about something or found a really beautiful way or metaphor to talk about something as though that actually is something that's gonna grow legs and walk out of the room and like, you know, feed someone. Um, and unfortunately it doesn't, but I do think what poetry, the way poetry can bridge that gap is by incurring or inciting curiosity 
And I think that's something that writing and, and art in general can do. Like, I think that I have my, the first novel was about a Palestinian family. And I, one of the loveliest things that came out of it that was very unexpected, because I very much wrote it sort of for my community and thinking about my family and blood of friends and whatever, um, was that there were a lot of people who knew very little about Palestine aside from what they had been told about it, um, who reached out and were like, wow, this family made me really curious and invested and interested in this part of the world and in this in this different narrative. And so I went and I learned about it. So I think like art can play kind of that role, um, but, I, but I am always just mindful of like self-lionizing or like the yeah. tendency of artists to be like, I'm an artist, it's like, that's cool. Yeah, okay, what else have you done? <laughs> like, I just don't, yeah, it's, it's just not a replacement for like also, again, like actionable things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have, I think that you know, I can't improve upon what's been said, but I agree with it all. I have a lot, I think about this a lot. Um, I think about art as a channel of one's goodness, just as, you know, how one behaves with waiters is a channel of one's goodness sure. and how one, you know, how one treats their grocer is a channel of one's goodness and how one, you know, behaves towards small animals. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that it is a channel, right? Which, mm -hmm. is, which is to say that it's a part of it, but I think that, um, I think of, I mean, this is going to sound obnoxious, but I think of poetry in this way very similarly to how I think of prayer, which is to say, when I get on my knees and I pray for my mother or I pray for the unhoused in my community, which is part of my practice, you know, I do pray, I am a person who prays. Um, I don't, I'm not like summoning an interventionist God to like come and like, you know, give everyone a five course meal. You know what I'm saying? Like I pray and then that points me towards the action, mm -hmm. which is, you know, maybe I go down to the soup kitchen and I chop onions for an hour that day. Right. And that is like my way of being useful that way. Right. You know, is like, um, or, you know, I pray for my mom's health and then I call her and ask her if she's taken her medicine. Right. Because mm -hmm. sometimes she forgets. Right. And that's how prayer works. Right. In my life. That's what, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone on the other end of the line. Frankly, it's none of my business. Right. Um, but, uh, but I know that being on my knees puts me present towards the intentions that I need. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, if I am holding a resentment towards somebody, you know, praying for that person, um, praying for patience and grace and dealing with that person reminds me when I deal with that person that I had just asked for this before and that this person has found this mechanism by which to move through a world that has been rigged against them just like I have. You know what I'm saying? Um, and that is the way in which prayer and poetry both kind of work in my life. I don't write a poem critical of empire and then say, oh, my job is done, or a poem about, <laughs> you know, the climate crisis and say, oh, my job is done, right? I write a poem about the climate crisis and then, you know, I plant a tree in my backyard with my niece like I did this weekend. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the sort of, that's the sort of thing, that's the way that poetry has worked in my life as, um, as action, which is to say, you know, the poet, the great Iraqi poet Dunya Mikhail says, uh, the poem, shit, the poem is not medicine, it's an x-ray. Right, mm -hmm. um, which is to say, like, it's not going to cure the broken bone, but it'll show it to you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, I also think, and this is a slightly spicier take, but uh, I also think that um, hmm, how do I want to say this? I think that what often, in, okay, let me back up and be sort of obnoxiously esoteric about it. Um, in physics, the principle of work refers to an object, uh, force applied to an object in order to move it, right? Um, force applied to an object in order to move it. And so I think often inhabiting the carapace of revolutionary rhetoric and then offering that to a community that more or less already agrees. Like if I say, well, I'm in a church, so I'm like low, but if I say like, Trump is bad, you know, mm -hmm. uh, most of the people here I can reliably expect will agree with me, right? You know what I mean? And like, if you don't, you know well enough that you're gonna be outnumbered in this like poetry festival, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, so, and so like, I'm not really like causing anything to move, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm inhabiting the carapace of 
you know, sort of pseudo-revolutionary rhetoric without actually risking anything, right? Uh, and I think that a lot of art, you know, I'm, I'm obviously creating a caricature of what I'm talking about, but like, I think a lot of art is sort of about that ethically complex today. You know, like I think, I think the ethical, com I mean, I think it's not a coincidence that the dominant cultural artifact of our moment is the Marvel movie in which you have like a, a big, a good guy and then a big bad guy chaos agent comes into town and then the good guy dispels the chaos agent and then like everything returns to the status quo, right? A, a return to the status quo is a fundamentally conservative position and to valorize that, right, is like a fundamentally like regressive take. But um, I say this to say the people who are doing things that actually feel risky to me, like the, po the poet Jose Olivares has a poem where he says, I don't have health insurance. There's no way to make that beautiful. I don't have health mm. insurance. That's, that's the three lines, that's three lines from his poem, right? He's risking, to my mind, what he's risking is someone saying, oh, that's not a very good poem, right? Someone saying, that's not very beautiful, right? Because that, that, that language isn't beautiful. No one's gonna get that tattooed on themselves, right? That's not, that's not language that is like, you know, you wanna like recite at your wedding, right? It's ugly. It's ugly, just like the fact is ugly. It's crazy that in a, in a first world nation, right, that, that anyone has to worry about, you know? Um, and risking our expectations of art being beautiful, right? Um, there's an essay by the poet Phil Meters where he's talking about 9-11 and he says, um, he has Lebanese family, and he says, uh, I'm almost afraid to write this, but now reflecting on it 10 years, la 10 years later, 15 years, I forget, but he's like, now reflecting on it, um, I want to write what I thought then, which is now they know how we feel, right? Which is a terrifying thing. Like, I'm, even me saying it right now, like, you know, I was paid to come here and talk to you guys, but like, even me sitting here right now quoting another writer saying that makes me feel scared. You know what I mean? Um, to say something like that, right? Um, but it's true, like, you know, like in 1988, uh, a US naval warship shot a civilian Iranian airplane out of the sky, right? And 290 people, including 66 children on board, were killed, right? If, if, if Iran had shot the plane that we took to get here out of the sky, Iran would be turned to glass. You know what I'm saying? Like, Iran would be, you know what I'm saying? Like, like it was just a civilian plane. You know what I'm saying? These things happen every day all around the world, right? But for Phil to say that in a piece, that felt like risk to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, People have been writing about like eating ass and smoking pot since the 50s. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, no, I'm really, but, um, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Like Ginsburg, Ginsburg wrote Howl in the 50s, you know what I mean? Like this stuff isn't, I mean, it's like, it like sounds like it's risky. It sounds like it's being provocative, but it's like we, people have been saying this stuff for like 75 years in American literary, right? Or you know what I mean? Like what actual risk looks like today often isn't the sort of like sexy, bombastic, you know, that sort of, you, 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 anyways, I'm, I'm, I don't even remember what the question was, sorry. <laughs> I want to take a, a bank shot off what you just said. Um, it seemed to me in Pilgrim Bell that, and push back if this does, isn't right, but um, you speak pretty explicitly about who suffers and who watches, mm -hmm. and it's much more political. Um, I don't know who said this. If I had known how long this would linger with me, I would have paid more attention. But I read this <laughs> statement, and I'd love to hear your response to it, particularly since we have a gardening theme. And the statement is, colonizers write about gardening. Hmm. It's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Very provocative. What? What is there like an? Were they like? There's no in, context. Okay. I mean, I was kind of assuming it was metaphorical and sure. you know cultivation and all of that. I'm trying to think of like the famous colonial gardening example. Like what? To, it's hard to just reflect on an abstract assertion without like clinging it to. What made me defensive about my tomato poems, and I don't, <laughs> sure, I sure. don't think that's yeah. what. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like Palestinian poets write about day trees. I, like I, it just does, like I'm I'm reflexively skeptical of the certainty of the statement, which I yes. guess. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, well, no, I I'm, I'm also no. Yeah, I mean, colonizers write about all sorts of things. They yeah, write, yeah, but they yeah, write yeah, about like their suffering. Yeah, they write about yeah. their yeah. They write. I don't about want colonizers stuff. to get a monopoly on garden writing. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that and also I think like it's yeah. I mean, like colonizers write about suffering too. Yeah, like they write about the things that I mean. Yeah, I think the yeah. Yeah. I also heard that eco-poets who aren't 
overtly political in their work are called moss poets or something. Somebody was telling me <laughs> on Twitter. But, but for me, a lot of it is to that flexing of I am more aware than you or I'm doing more work than you mm -hmm. and you aren't trying, like your work isn't, isn't X, Y, or Z mm -hmm. or like doing it the way that I believe work needs to be done. But I also beautiful thing about middle age is like, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> middle age. <laughs> I have no idea even why I've made some of the decisions I have or why I'm making the decisions I am. I certainly don't have an answer to crises. I don't think I get to tell anyone else how to make their work. Mm -hmm. I don't think I know anything certain about poetry. Mm -hmm. um, but like thinking about how to be good, I used to teach superheroes in American literature. Mm -hmm. And one of our biggest takeaways was about how superheroes are always... Uh, reactive rather than proactive. Mm. It is the thing of like somebody, they, and they all, so we would do um, on our um, acts of service, we would uh, have like goodness days where we went out and tried to make people's days brighter. And then we had a hero for a day project where we picked somebody and gave them the best day of their life or tried to, you know. Um, we would find out secret things about them and then we would show up in bear Aww. costumes to bring them coffee in the morning and we'd do these silly fun things. Um, because goodness is not showy. We like heroes, mm -hmm. we, and, which isn't to say we shouldn't love our firefighters and like love you know, like the people who come to rescue, but we reward heroism and not caregiving. Mm. We, we want one big spectacle, one big moment, not the ongoing and yeah. arduous care of others. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way our culture works, and that's how we want to define goodness, is the loudest voice in the room, the riskiest running into the building on fire, yeah. mm -hmm. the, the dude in the cape who frankly made some of these problems start and has all the capital in the world to address some of the systemic issues in his city and he's not doing it. Um, so, but, but it also, to finish the hero metaphor also, they have the same fucking origin story. I'm sorry I'm swearing so much. I, it's too much passion, I'm sorry. Okay, no more F-bombs. Um, they have the same origin, which is grief. Both the heroes and the villains, like uh, Mr. Freeze just wants to bring his wife back. He's just hurting. He just sucks at grief. Um, and I, I think it's true though. Okay, Katie, I know we need to talk about Marvel and we have a lot of thoughts. Okay, but, <laughs> but I think, again, I think poetry is actually really good at reminding us what to be alive for. And I think it's also really good at making us feel less alone in our grief. Mm -hmm. And if a big piece of what makes somebody an a-hole or you know, a sociopath who poisons the city water and you know, takes over the Thanksgiving parade, um, that's a Joker reference and not anything that's happening. <laughs> um, if, if, if grief is what can drive people to great horrors, but supposedly it's also what drives our heroes, then I think figuring out how we, I don't, oh, I hate this phrase, but how we suffer better, um, how we manage our suffering, how we find community in our suffering, mm -hmm. Batman needs a family, um, right? Like, <laughs> I think there are still some corny messages in there, but for me, that going back to feeling less alone and learning from others sharing in that feeling seen, the tears that stay visible on the mm -hmm. cheeks, right? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like our writing are the visible tears of, of things we have lived through. Mm -hmm. And I do think if we are with each other bodily um, and also on the page, then I do think it helps. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fix it. It's the, the x-ray, not the medicine. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think it helps. too, you're, in your writing, um, the progression in your books is that there's more playfulness yeah. there. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is there's a little more mischief in every book. Um, not in any way to minimize or erase the shadow. I mean, God, yeah. those essays about your friend's murder and that poem about the, um, uh, I can't even say it, the active shooter and you yeah. as a mom and you as a teacher. Um, obviously, declining marriage. All, all of those things are in there, but they're alongside um, a, a quality of lightness that comes in, which for me broadens the aesthetic and maybe reduces my anxiety a little. I don't know. Um, how, how do you manage that in such weighty times? Because sometimes we just feel real earnest, you know, yeah. and that's kind of boring. I mentioned this at the craft talk as well, so if, for those who just already heard it, I'm sorry, but I always try and think about the reader as somebody I love. 
Um, yeah. And that doesn't guarantee that I always, I, I want to be good at love so bad. It's like the, the biggest goal I have with my whole life is like, I just want to be good at loving people. Um, I think it's like the coolest, most amazing thing we get to do. Um, and I, I really want to be good at, but that doesn't mean I do it perfectly, which doesn't mean like all of my poems are that I nail it. But if I think in revision about how can I be generous to this person? How can I be careful with the, inform like the things I reveal? How can I both try and communicate and allow for complexity? I heard Carl Phillips say it, but I think it, it, I think it was somebody else that he was quoting, but that the world is not a clear place and do we dishonor it by trying to be too clear about it? Mm. To reduce it to well, you know, okay. statements like, you know, colonizers get the gardens or whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, of like, it, it usually can't be reduced to a statement, thank God, um, if they're there. Um, and for me, that's, it's not a surefire way. I don't have answers um, for anyone, even myself, but that that's a good North Star for me of like thinking about, do I love the other person on the end of this poem mm. um, to make sure I'm careful with them and speak to them and to myself, because maybe that's also who's on the other end of the mm. poem, with as much grace as possible. Um, and yeah, to make my poems, even if they're dark, I still want to restore people to themselves at the end. Mm. Also, I think I am healing and I think I am happier. And I also think poems are part of how I've gotten there. <laughs> oh my gosh, we're testing. <laughs> Do you have suggestions for how to introduce a little more playfulness, Com complex tone. I can't improve upon what Tracy said. I think that was so beautiful. Yeah, it was, was pretty good. Beautiful. Okay, and that's good. Tears to yeah, I don't want to We know. can leave it there. Um, I want to talk a minute about use of self in poetry and how I'll start with you because as therapists, we're trained to bear witness and to listen and to take in um, others' stories and kind of pour it through the sieve of our self yes. and before we respond. And for me, that seems very similar to writing. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't assume that the I is the poet. So I'm curious what you think is the obligation of the poet to the truth when using first person singular. Mm. And I'm thinking about your wonderful novels where particularly in the arsonist city where all of the characters have the same experiences but very different mm -hmm. points of view. How do you get at that with poetry? Hmm. I do not think we have an obligation towards anything if we use the I in poetry. Um, and maybe I say that because I've hidden behind poetry a lot. And so I think, you know, the, the last, the 29th year, I wrote a lot about like, I started writing about queerness and sex and addiction and things like that a little bit more directly. And I had some family pushback and I was like, it's poetry. Can you relax? It's just a book of poems. And so, I don't know if you understand what poetry is, but, and so I think there's, I think there's something about that, that I like, I, 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 as someone that's working on nonfiction now, I, I like that in poetry you have the capacity to be costumed or costume or play with the self or play with different versions of the self. I think like, you know, I mean, I think in the 29th year I played with the eye a lot and, and some of it was like imaginal eye and some of it were these sort of like imaginary futures mm -hmm. and some of them were like sort of past versions of the self that, you know, would have happened if this had changed or that had changed. So I think just being able to sort of play with kind of like internal family systems work in therapy where there's like sort of the exiled self and there's the firefight, like there's different parts of the self. Yeah. Um, bringing that onto the page is... Yeah, I think has been really, has been really lovely. But I don't, yeah, I don't know that I feel, I don't know that I feel like there are any rules in general about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of think that it is whatever resonates with you and you, I, I've, I've long said this, like you can write about whatever you want and you have to be able to answer to it. 
and that's it. Those are the two combinations, right? Like you can you can do whatever you want, and then also you have to be able to speak to that thing that you did. That's where the responsibility comes. That's in. That's where accountability comes in, right? Because yeah. I think we'll sometimes have classes where people will be like, well, okay, so like I'm a white cis whatever, and I want to write about this kind of character from this kind of background, and like people are saying I can. I'm like, I don't know that anyone's telling you you can't. But I'll, but also like you can do whatever you want, but like people are also then entitled to have reactions to it. And so thinking about like the concept of accountability when we think about the ways that self intersects with, and authenticity intersects with writing. Um, yeah, I think that's something that I've been trying to work with some students in particular around. Yeah. What's your poetic superpower? <laughs> you know, a lot of us know um, Greg Orr's template, uh, the story, music, imagination, and form. Mm -hmm. what, what do you rely on the most? And then also the second part of that question is how do you move beyond that which you do well, your own algorithms and things that repeat? How do you retain the things that make you you as a writer and um, shake it up and do something new? Mm. Well, I've just written a novel and that is not something that I've ever done. Uh, I, I'm impressed. Um, I, you know, while everyone was off learning Esperanto or writing Lear or whatever over, <laughs> Sour you, know, you know, yeah. Um, uh, my thing was to teach myself narrative. You know, I, I have, you know, been within the Creative Writing Academy for a minute now. Though I will say that I knew the four sentence types because I used to teach middle school, and like I used to have to teach that, and that's where I learned the four sentence types was as a middle school teacher, not. Um, not in any sort of higher ed. So in my, uh, I'll, I'll put that feather in my proletariat bona fides. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm also fasting right now, so my brain is just moving really slow. I apologize if I you sound like I'm like, thank you. I appreciate You're very it. Welcome. I appreciate the affirmation. Um, yeah, so my thing over quarantine was that I was going to learn narrative, and I, um, I approached it as a total, you know, my, I think that my superpower insofar as I have one is just, like, uh, ultra-discursive thinking, you know what I mean? Like, I, um, I tend to think, like, seven valences away from the thing that I'm actually mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, and then sort of like work my way back to it, right? Which is great for poetry, terrible for narrative, right? Yes. Um, and so over quarantine, I read two novels a week and watched a movie a day and like my, like I was trying to understand, you know, the thing that I was really good at was, ha or not good at, but the thing that came very naturally to me was having like interesting people have heady conversations with each other. You know what I mean? Like that was, you know, that That's was. That's my worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm terrible. Page really. turner. <laughs> it's not. I read your work. It's not. Um, but you know, like that was that was. That was a breeze, you know, because again, that's functionally how poetry works is you just mm -hmm. have like an interlocutor in whom you're curious, right? Um, and you just sort of let them wax. Yeah, the, getting people through doorways and onto planes <laughs> and like sat at the same table. That's so funny. Yeah, it was <laughs> like, really funny. it was so hard. Like it's like, and I was just, I would just watch like, and, and like th with the movies that I was watching, because like the novels, I just have so many cavities in my content knowledge that I was just like trying to plug all the, and every time I plugged a hole, like two more would pop mm. up. It was like one of those car old cartoons, you know? Um, uh, but yeah, I was just trying to plug the holes in my content knowledge. But with the movies, I would just watch anything, you know, truly anything. And so like one day I'd be watching like Cassavetes and the next day I'd be watching like Pineapple Express or whatever. And like what I was really interested in was just how, like movement right. worked, right? Like how characters met each other, how they, you know, went into the rising action, mm -hmm. how they like found their way to the, you know, how, like how you signaled the end of a, you know, the end of a second act, the start of the third, you know what I mean? Like, just mm -hmm. like, I remember, uh, we shouldn't be quoting Derek Walcott, he was a bad guy, but I'm gonna quote him real quick and you'll forgive me for it. Um, I don't mean to say we shouldn't, you, you should, take whatever you want from him. Uh, I believe in reparative reading, not paranoid reading. Um, but uh, but um, there's, a, there's a famous anecdote about him teaching a playwriting class and, um, and this 
this now famous poet who I won't name because I can't remember if this was told to me or if I read it, um, uh, was taking this class and said, um, and had written this play about uh, these two characters who were locked in a cage and they were having this, you know, big heady conversation. And it was like really interesting and dynamic and they were like locked in a cage the whole time. And then Derek Walcott at the end of it was like, no one's gonna give a shit about your play unless they know where they piss. You know, uh, That's <laughs> you know, so funny. you know, and it, you know, and if they're like locked in a kit, you know, it's like, well, that's uh, that's uh, probably Jermaine, you know, and it's like, uh, and it's like, and that was like, that was so uh, hard for me, you know, like metaphorically speaking, like knowing where my characters piss, you know, in my in my amazing. novel, you know, like again, like I know how to write sentences, but I don't know how to write scenes, mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so just like truly starting at the beginning and just like studying in the manner of like, you know, figuring out how a watch works by taking apart like 30 of them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which I don't even know if that would work. But uh, <laughs> there's something about like the irreducible complexity of a watch, so that was a bad example. But uh, but you know what I'm saying, like the, just like, uh, and that was thrilling to me because it was like so working against the thing that I mm. feel like I'm naturally good at. Mm-hmm. You know? I can't wait to read your novel. I, <laughs> I can't wait to share it with you. I'm going to keep thinking about where they're pissing. Yeah. <laughs> no, for real. For real. I'm like, really going to be... I swear to God. I'm going like, to be on the lookout. Yo, every <laughs> chapter, like, like, that is, like, a real It's an answered question. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's like, right. and, like, it's, like, it's, it's probably, like, artlessly demarcated. You know, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, and they got the money from this... Like, from really the, clunky you know, exposition. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 He said, gesturing towards the toilet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he gestured towards the tree, which was as tall as a six-foot-four tree, you know. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Oh, my, my poetic superpowers. I think, I think that I'm, I'm pretty, I'm very quick, which I'm very grateful for. I'm fast. That is. And I'm all about instant gratification. <laughs> so I'm all about, like, let's do it, let's done, here's a poem, it's great. I'm, I think also the other superpower is that I'm not precious with my work which feels, I mean, I think now having known a lot of writers, unusual, and I'm very yeah. grateful for that. Yeah. So like, I will write what I'll write. I hate revision. I hate editing and I hate revising. Um, and I feel completely fine putting it in the hands of like editors or mm-hmm. agents or whatever and being like, what do you think? And I've, I mean, I write very wordy, very long first drafts of everything. And so the both novels had like probably a hundred to 150 pages cut from them because they were like, this is not sellable. We don't, we, I don't know what you're doing here. And then my, and then with the poetry collection, yeah, like I know people that will really, I mean, the, the order of poems and the way they're sectioned off is like an art. And I'm very good at being like, I'm, I'm very good at outsourcing things that are not my strengths. Mm. And I'm very good at being like, this I'm good at, this I'm not that great at. And so the 29th year I worked with Jenny Zhu at, um, at uh, Houghton Mifflin, Jesus, yikes! yikes. <laughs> well, they were eaten at this point, so it doesn't matter. But like Houghton sure, Mifflin, yeah. <laughs> and and and, Jen, and I like literally wrote Jenny, and I was like, look, I have all the poems, and they're in a word document, and I don't really know how to even begin to put them in order. And she was like, really, I can do whatever I want, and I was like, please. And she ordered it, and she did this amazing job, and she figured out what the sections could be. And I feel like that's. That is something that might feel invasive for another writer that's or intrusive nice. or something like that. And I'm like, beautiful. Like, that's your strength. It's not one of my strengths. And, like, it worked out. That's awesome. Yeah. No. I don't mean to brag, but I've been called extra before. <laughs> <laughs> no I, way. <laughs> that was hyperbole, I'm sure. Yeah. But I think if, if people like too much, I'm a good person. <laughs> That is so cute. <laughs> of like, I'm fine to be a subway spreader. I like to take up space. I like to add every noun gets a couple of adjectives. Mm-hmm. Like all the accessories will be on. <laughs> um, I, if you like, uh, you know, a Sunday with the bananas and the whipped cream and the cherries and the sprinkles, like mm-hmm. I'm your gal. Um, but I'm not good, you know. So then I struggle with brevity. It's hard for me to like cut it off. A library asked me for 16 poems that were 150 words or less. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I could take a poem and turn it into tiny little, tiny little things. Um, but actually, that request has been really beautiful for me because now I am. Now I'm quick. It's a single draft. I am trying to get this library their 16 poems for their Amazing. park walk. And it's been, and I don't care. <laughs> 
But I mean, that's, that sounds terrible, but it's, it's so nice to just, normally I'm trying to, you know, fashion myself, understand myself, hold a mirror up to myself. Right now I'm just having a good ass time playing. Yes. I'm just having fun. I'm just taking things from my day. I still want it to be, there's still too many adjectives, mm. but um, I am able to cut it off at 100 to 150 words. And it was sometimes getting the request or making something for others explicitly, mm. right? You can always say like, oh, the reader. But like when you're like getting commissions or where people want specific things from you, it's my favorite thing about working in a laureate ship is that I don't feel attached to the poems in the same yeah. way. And I actually mm -hmm. kind of like that. It's not like, mm -hmm. oh, it's not great art or it's not, it's not as meaningful to me. I don't think they're terrible poems. I, you know, but I'm just having fun and I'm just, getting to give people what they're asking for. It's like taking commissions and other kind of art. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of like just being able to let go mm -hmm. um, and not torture myself. And like, do I fully understand myself through this poem that I have written? And like, sometimes it, they're just selfies, right? <laughs> Instead of portraits. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun. And it is kind of nice not to have to, you know, oh, like I, I actually do love revision. Um, and when I'm working on my own poems that are about me-ish, um, an, a me-ish kind of eye than I do torture them for a very long time. Mm. Um, but it is kind of nice to take a break from that and just, yeah, the, the little selfies. Can I add, it reminds me of, there's yeah. an Aladon concept of detach with love. Mm -hmm. And like that's, I really love that concept in life and I really love it in writing. Because I think that's also a really nice way to keep reorienting your North Star back to like the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do I like this? Do I like it for the result? Do I like it for the book? Do I like it for the what? I mean, not really, not really, if I'm completely honest. Not, I don't, you know. It's, it, it can be a perk, but I actually find publishing and final products to be oftentimes a very grief-filled process. You know, I'm saying goodbye to a thing that we're, so if I can kind of recenter what I really love about it, which is the doing of it and the making of it, then, then it really facilitates this kind of detachment. But like, like you're saying, it's not a bad thing when you're like, mm -hmm. I don't care. It's like, yeah, it's done with love. Like this is, this is not, it's kind of not mine anymore. Once I'm done, that's sort of how I feel about things. Yeah. It's finished and now it's out in the world. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm mindful of the time. Um, oh, wow. I want to make sure that people who are in the audience have an opportunity to ask questions. I had a couple more things, but um, I got engrossed and kind of lost tracks. So, um, are there folks who have inquiries? Mm. Okay, then I'll just keep They're going. I got questions. a couple yes. more. <laughs> um, and if someone thinks of something, holler. We have about 10 more minutes, I think. If place and history shape who we become, both as writers and people. I'm curious if there's a place or a memory that really maybe draws out the fullness of who you are, but I'm really more interested if there are places or times in your life that you have zero curiosity about hmm. or hmm. no interest in exploring. Childhood. That's a really, really good question. <laughs> that reminds me of Joan Didion's like, stay on nodding terms with yourselves mm. or else they're going to come up in the middle of the night. I'm a terror. By the way, can I just say, I'm shocked by how many quotes you both remember and how effortless, you're like, as the sculptor blah blah said, and then you say the full line. I've literally been quoted back things I've said and been oh, like, oh. Oh, I'm much better at remembering things than other people have said. What? But I gave it's away. Remarkable. I gave away the in the in the craft talk of like I begin every book with by blessing the book and writing down my favorite quotes about so poetry. So then you remember so them over that and over way. and over and over again. Every time I begin a journal, I'm blessing it with the best writing possible, oh. and so it always has like. So I'm rewriting these quotes over and over okay, and over again. Okay, okay. So like they've just been with me for Thanks years. Thanks for making me feel better. Yeah, because <laughs> I've been like, are they geniuses? And am I an idiot? <laughs> like, okay. I, 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 I really like that question. I would say I'm not, ooh. I'm not that curious about the time I spent in Oklahoma as a, like in my, in grade you school. You have a really good poem about Oklahoma though. I do. And, and you know what's complicated. funny? See, writing is like a Rorschach test where it's like you, it shows things that are in your subconscious without you seeing them. Like I had this, someone come up, come up to me after a reading once and was like, I teach your book and blah, blah, blah. And we look at the birds in this book. And I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck. I've never written about a bird a day in my life. 
And then that night I went home and I looked through it and I counted it and there were like 42 birds. They were, they were everywhere. And so there's something about like, I do, my subconscious leaves its fingerprints on all, all of, and because I don't like to revise and because I'm like, it's not mine anymore, take it world. I don't actually know what's in it a lot of the time. And so I, I think there's been something there's been, there have been times where I would say consciously, I'm like, I don't really, I don't really care that much about like the time in Oklahoma. Cause it was a really shitty time. We just left mm-hmm. my parents taught asylum. We just left Kuwait, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, not doing great there socially. Um, but it does sneak up in some of the stuff that I write. And so it does come up, but I would say at least in terms of what I find accessible, that's a, that's a version of myself that I do not spend probably enough time with. And she's probably going to show up and wreck everything at some point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that I think that I'm kind of in the time that I'm not interested in. Uh, <laughs> That's a great answer. No, no, here I really and now. Well, I really do. You're like right now here with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just um, it's a beautiful question and not one I think That's I've ever been question. asked before. Yeah. Um, but you know, I had you know, as everyone did, I had a difficult childhood and, um, you know, and uh, so many of the ways that I, and then I went from a difficult childhood to like a kind of like rapscallion rumspringa for, <laughs> you know, you know, like, uh, you know, I was, I was being a little, uh, I was, you know, I was a little fella. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't, you, you, you guys know my work. Uh, it's not, it's Googleable. Um, and, and now I'm just like, I'm comfy. You know what I mean? Like I'm fine, you know? And it's like, I'm interested in other people and in history and in time. And I'm interested in the people that I've been and the ways in which the person that I, if, you know, I've been sober for, if I don't mess up between now and July, I'll have been sober for a decade and it'll be a (laughs) thing. It feels very, <laughs> thank you. It's a thing where um, growing up my, in, in, in Islam or in Arabic, you would say inshallah when you inshallah. talk about like the, the future and my parents would always talk about like the farmer who was like, yeah, we'll have a big harvest this year, but he forgot to say inshallah, you know? And so then, you know, God like withered his crops, you know? And so like, I have like that sort of like, you know, like a retributive God thinking about, you know, anytime I acknowledge something happening in the future without mm-hmm. also acknowledging the possibility of like my dying before it happens or whatever, uh, like the, that I'll be like sort of struck by an Olympian thunderbolt or something. But, um, but I'm inner, you know, I, I had zany adventures and I was like, I would, I would tell people, I would literally like the sentence would come out of my mouth. I would tell people, I'm just living the poems, I'm not writing, you know, and like, and like, <laughs> and I would say that with this chilling lack of irony, and, <laughs> and, and people would, you know what I mean, and, uh, but it kind of turned out to be true, you know, like, mm-hmm. I was just much more, like, I'm like a tenured guy with a dog, you know what I mean, like, nothing interesting happens to me, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but interesting stuff happens to the world and interesting stuff has happened to the world and interesting Mm -hmm. stuff happens sort of psycho-spiritually and maybe, you know, maybe like fasting is a way of sort of inducing that, Mm -hmm. you know, but, um, but yeah, I would say that, you know, I, I'm interested in the future and I'm interested in the past and weirdly I feel not very Mm -hmm. connected to the present. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. That is really interesting. I, I hate my childhood. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to write about it. I don't want to talk about it. Therapists are always like, tell me about your mother. I'm like, God, this shit again. Um, but I, I actually, the question's also making me think about how I think I spent a lot of my childhood imagining my mother's childhood. And it has been even like an adult question of like, if I had a time machine, the thing I would do is go back and love my mom as a child so that she could have grown up into the kind of person who could have loved me better Um, and I know like not only is that not possible but those I don't know that is it only love that she needed that was that's what she said she needed Um, is it because she wasn't loved well enough that she did the things that she did and said the things that she said Um, and could I just go back and love her right Um, or enough or something and and fix that Um, 
but I, I just look back on my, I don't, I've always wondered why people are interested in their childhoods. I'm like, oh, stupid. I, I had to live through it. I don't want to think about it some more. Um, so I just like, I'm not curious about, um, but I will say my child is forcing me to kind of recall yeah. certain moments and yeah, subconsciously things will show up. Um, or things like I'll have these like knee-jerk responses to things, and I'll be like, "Oh my God, Tracy, <laughs> you need to reflect on why that." Like, oh, I was watching Grey's Anatomy to connect with my students, and um, <laughs> because I teach medical humanities, and so oh, okay. they all watch it, right? And then I had to have cute, fun memes that would relate to the content. And so I was watching Grey's Anatomy, and the main character, who has like be the most tragic character and cry in every episode, she's recovering like this memory of her mom trying to to die in front of her. And I was like, only once, suck it up, you pansy. And I was like, maybe we need to take a minute. If a whole writer's room is like, you know what the worst backstory is we can think of for a person? Maybe we should take a minute and think about why we think this isn't a big deal. Or like, you know. So I just like have to keep confronting things from childhood all the time. Um, or it makes me, it breaks my heart because, you know, then I wouldn't do s things to my son that were done to me. Right. And it does make you have to be like, God, how much pain did somebody have to be in in order to do that? Mm. Um, or, you know, so you do end up having it like, but I don't want to think about it, but I'm going to have to. Um, and yeah, but I just, the child is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I hope my son is a beautiful one. And on that note. <laughs> Um, we're going to close with a little nod to our legacies, and I'm wanting to know who, whose shadow you walk in, who are your poetry heroes. Besides the rest of the panel? Mm. You, it can be whoever Tracy. you want, Tracy. <laughs> no rules. Yeah. I always forget. I, it's, oh, this just happened earlier. It's like I've never read a book in my yeah. life. Turn, turns, <laughs> turns out I can't name another poet. I'll start. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I will say that, um, you know, we talk about, I think that epigenetics is like a very sort of voguish, you know, topic, especially mm -hmm. in talking about like intergenerational trauma and stuff like that. But if you believe in the existence of something like intergenerational trauma, then probably also you believe in the, that, like, wouldn't it stand to reason that you have like intergenerational strengths too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you know, thinking about, you know, not to be like too sort of self aggranda you know, I'm, I... I've never, well, but you know, like in Iran, there's like a very deep culture of poetry, right? Mm -hmm. Like Shiraz is like, there are like thousands and thousands of pilgrims at Shiraz every day to visit the grave of Hafez. You know what I'm saying? Like it yeah, is like, there's like, there's like nothing, there's like no equivalent of that in the States. Yeah. There's not like, maybe like visiting Graceland and Elvis and stuff, you know, but like, <laughs> but, it, but it's like, but like, it's like if Elvis lived like 600 years ago, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's like, there's nothing like, it's not a religious thing. You know, the, the joke is that in every Persian household, there are two books, the Quran and Hafez, mm -hmm. and only one gets read, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> you know? And, it's like, and it's like, there's just no equivalent of, you know, there's nothing like that in America, you know, mm -hmm. like there's no corollary, right? And so I, I, you know, I'm not saying, this is not me saying like, I am like Hafez and Rumi mm -hmm. and Saadi, you know, but it is like, there is a long lineage of deep, respect and reverence for the capacity of the spoken word artfully, mellifluously arranged to thin the partition between us and the divine, right? And that is what I'm up to, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that, um, whether that divine be a capital G God who sits on a throne in heaven and gets mad when we lie, or whether that be, um, you know, whether our divine is land or justice or grace mm -hmm. or, you know, our children mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I would say being able to write into that tradition, which has preceded me by millennia and will continue long after the last person has forgotten my name, feels mm. really, really, feel, it feels like a really big privilege. I'm going to take Hafez, too. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah just Hafez across that's the board. That's it, that's it. Hafez. <laughs> Hafez. Yeah. I would say Hafez, I'd say Darwish. I would say that I, um, I was given a book of poetry by an English teacher when I was in Beirut, um, like 14 or something, by Suhair Hamad, who was this um, you know, American-based Palestinian poet writing about things like 9-11. And I was just like, really? That is something that 
can be done. And I was, and again, it's interesting to have read things while in the Middle East. Like I, I spent so much of my life in the Arab world and then going back and forth, but it was, that was really transformative. And I think in terms of fiction that like Jhumpa Lahiri, I would say the, the first two books I remember reading and being like, I can like feel that in my bones were Amy Tan and Jhumpa Lahiri. And they both were these sort of like multi-generational story, you know, no. Yeah. I just want to say, I think poetry in general is the family I always wished I had. Mm -hmm. Like I do, when I go to writing conferences and see people, it really is like a family reunion to me. I genuinely love so, so, so many poets and feel seen by them in ways my own family doesn't and like understood, cared about. And that's not to say every poet is a great person, uh, but I, I have received so much care in within the community of poets. Um, and that's the people that I've learned from, um, the people that I'm still learning from, the dead that I feel close to. Um, and uh, Susan reminded me that I gave this recommendation, which I heard Gregory Orr talk about, and I might have misunderstood. That's my other secret power, is I misunderstand all the time. But I actually feel like my mishearings work out to my benefit, or I read really fast, and the way I misread turns into a line for me because that. it turns out not to be what actually was there. Um, but he said that uh, he, he gave us all a quest during this craft talk, and he said the quest is to hand copy all the beloveds into a book. And, and so I hand copy all of my favorite poems in a book. Um, Susan says she's on volume two now. I'm also on my volume two. But every time I encounter, I think I started with John Donne's Batter My Heart, Three Person God for you is yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend. Um, so I started with John Donne. <laughs> Um, I, you know, and then I think I have Bridget Pegeen Kelly, who I tattooed on my arm like an idiot. Um, she would have hated that, but I love her, so she's with me now. Um, and, you know, then I just kept, and I do have, you know, Robert Frost and Louise Glick and Linda Gregg and Hafez, and I do have um, all sorts of, and I have a bunch of Neruda and Lorca and mm -hmm. everybody that I have loved and learned from, Seswa Miwosh and... Um, mm -hmm. James writes poems, and um, I'll read some tonight. I often, I'm thinking, some, my next book is called Love Prodigal, and part of what I did was I went back and reread everything that made me fall. I fell out of love with poetry. We had to get the spark back. So then um, I went on dates with all the books that I loved, and I, I wrote back. I used the titles in my first book and would write response poems to myself oh, to try I and, like, that. fall back in love and find the first thing um, again. And so I will tonight when I read to talk about um, the other people that are in the poem, the other songs that inspire things, the other um, poets that have inspired things, and the lineage that I, I want to be a part of so bad. Mm -hmm. Not in, in some way like, remind, like end up in somebody's book someday as like a, you know, hand copied beloved. I just want to live in a way in which I am a hand copied beloved. Um, but it's the best family that I have ever found. And I don't know if, you know, if I'm climbing on their shoulders to write anything at all, as Kava's brought up, what could I do to improve upon Milton? <laughs> but, you know, like, what can I say or do? But I, I think it's not even about improving upon or doing better. It's just enjoying the table um, and, and feasting alongside um, language and people whose presences and way of being in the world is something you enjoy and respect and want to celebrate. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for this lively conversation. Thank you for your great it questions. It was really fun. Yeah. Thank you. Woo.